When I say I knew nothing about Dragon Ball, like, I'm still shocked that this dude Goku got a tell. That shit is wild. Are you an everyday nerd? Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so that you don't miss the next episode. Yo, welcome to Your Everyday Nerd, the show where we catch up on things that everybody else had already seen when they were a kid. I'm your host, Zack Snyder. Today's Throwback Thursday. Happy Thursday. On Thursdays, we take a throwback all the way back to before the year 2000. That's that simple. When I was a kid and a teenager and a college student and, and about two months ago, I, um, I heard a lot of people talk about Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z. It's the thing that got so many people into anime. It's the thing that propelled anime and manga in the West. And yet, I myself have never seen or read it. Until now. So today we're talking all about the first saga or arc in the popular manga and anime Dragon Ball. Far away, in an enchanted land that seemed untouched by the steady march of time, the boy, known as Goku, is on his own, and has become the sole guardian of his grandfather's most mystical possession, his Dragon Ball. For those of you who don't know, Dragon Ball is a popular manga and anime series created by the legendary Akira Toriyama in 1984. It was originally serialized in Shonen Jump magazine every single week from 1984 to 1995, with its anime adaptation being divided into two main series, Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z. Since then, there's been 19 feature films and two additional sequel anime, Dragon Ball GT and the most recent Dragon Ball Super. To say that it's been a successful series is an understatement, considering that it's had ton of critical and mainstream success to the point where Goku, the main character, even had a float in the most recent Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. But like most things, I've been out of the loop on this Dragon Ball thing pretty much the entirety of my life. Dragon Ball has always been known to me as this superhero shonen that has a lot of filler, but everyone loves it because of nostalgia. I've also known about Akira Toriyama from Chrono Trigger because he did the artwork and the designs in that game, and Chrono Trigger is one of my favorite games of all time. The main reason I never got into Dragon Ball until now was because, number one, I didn't get into manga or anime until the end of high school. In college, I did end up collecting a lot of manga, so I actually bought like nine volumes of Dragon Ball, but I never read any of it because I was a little worried to get into it. I mean, this has such a legendary status. What if I don't like it? What if I'm too old? Because you know, Shonen is marketed towards little teenage boys. Like I'm not a little teenage boy anymore. So I was worried about that. And the biggest thing is what if it's nostalgia that makes it so good? What if everybody that I talk to that hypes it up likes it because of nostalgia? Also, a lot of people that I've talked to has talked about Dragon Ball Z and not Dragon Ball, the prequel or the beginning of it. Why is that? I, I don't know. I don't know. So I had to find out all these answers next time on Dragon Ball. No, no, that's not the point. The plan here is to try to watch and read all of Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, which is a big undertaking considering that both of them are extremely massive. There's 42 volumes of the original Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z manga. The Dragon Ball Super manga just started a few years ago and it's ongoing. So by the time I catch up, I'll actually be reading that chapter by chapter. And then there's over 600 episodes of the anime and all its sequels. So, so there's a lot here. Now, originally I was just going to read the manga since that's a lot more of a better undertaking. But since everybody that I've talked to knows so much more about the anime than the manga, I kind of needed to watch part of the anime because I wouldn't be getting the same experience with the series as everybody else did. Fortunately, I'm not going to try to like get through the entire series as fast as possible. I am going to do it in chunks. So I'm completely okay with going over it arc by arc for the next couple of years. So my main focus of the beginning of Dragon Ball was to read and watch the first saga, the Emperor Pilaf saga, and kind of figure out, did I like it? Is this something I want to watch and read more of? And this is basically my overall thoughts and reactions and all that to, to that first saga. Right off the bat, there were some immediate things that caught me by surprise. For starters, since I had heard about Dragon Ball Z growing up, I was shocked to not see some of those things in the first saga of Dragon Ball. And that's because there's a big difference between the two. 
As far as I know, both series do follow the main character Goku, the main difference being that Goku is an adult in Dragon Ball Z, while the original series covers his life as a kid. I do think it's kind of dope to see the evolution of characters over a long series. The main difference that I found with Dragon Ball compared to other shonen that I've watched or read is that Goku is not like a spoiled brat like Naruto is, or Ichigo, even from Bleach. Naruto is a pretty wholesome kid. He's, he's even pure at heart. He has to be pure at heart to ride his little Nimbus cloud, and that's kind of dope. I like, I like that I'm seeing a different character grow and evolve, and I'm really interested to see how that plays out. He's extremely naive, and that's going to be that's gonna be super interesting to see the end of. One of the other things that kind of caught me by surprise was the fact there were no mentions of like power levels, and there really weren't insanely long fight scenes. Apparently that's more of a Dragon Ball Z thing, rather than a Dragon Ball thing, or if any of that happens in Dragon Ball, it happens later, not in the first saga. Instead of fight scenes and power levels, the main focus of Dragon Ball, again at least the first saga, is fairly simple. The main characters are fighting the seven Dragon Balls, these MacGuffins that when found allow the user one wish, after which all seven Dragon Balls are then sent to different corners of the earth for the next person to find. And this was probably the biggest surprise to me was the fact that I knew they'd be searching for the Dragon Balls, but then at the end of the first saga, all seven Dragon Balls are found. And then they're wished on, and then they leave again. So I'm wondering, how many times are they going to be searching for the Dragon Balls in this series? Like seriously, the plot of the first saga could have easily just been a movie and be completely done, and it could have been a really, really good movie. But it's not, which makes me interested because, like, what's going to happen now? Because not only are the Dragon Balls all over the place again, but it takes an entire year for them to be found. So, that means the next year in the series is not going to be finding Dragon Balls. And I should probably go ahead and point out that I don't think this is a problem at all. I'm actually completely okay with it. I'm interested in the characters that we're being presented with, and I would much rather see them live their lives in whatever fashion that ends up being, rather than making an entire series fully focus on finding these MacGuffins. I know that One Piece, another series that I have way too many volumes, I bought like 20 something volumes that on sale, I know that One Piece is about finding the One Piece, but I don't know what the rest of the series is about. So I'm interested to get into that as well and see, well, how, how are those characters going to grow? What are their main goals going to be rather than just finding this thing? And I feel like that's where Dragon Ball is going is that, yes, they're searching for Dragon Balls occasionally, but it's more, more or less about the characters than anything else. It's also a great way to subvert your expectations. And that's one of the things that I think Toriyama is doing really well here. We are presented with characters in a story that we expect to go one way, but then all of a sudden Goku turns into a gigantic monkey. That was, uh, that was confusing to me, but it happened. It was dope, but it happened. It seems like to me that Toriyama is not planning on taking this series seriously, which I do appreciate. One of the things that a lot of mainstream shonen end up doing is taking things too seriously, sometimes to the point of being edgy. Unfortunately, what this does mean is that there's a different part of Dragon Ball that kind of annoys me, and that's part of its comedy. Now the part of the comedy that I did appreciate was the almost big sister little brother relationship that Goku and Bulma form. Goku is a naive child who's never met another human being except for his adopted grandfather who is currently dead. So seeing him interact with Bulma, especially since he's never met a girl either, it, it does have some entertaining and funny moments. The part of the comedy that I didn't particularly enjoy is what I'm afraid to be the comedy that the series focuses on a lot, which is toilet humor and perverted jokes. It seems like this is going to be more of a focus in the anime rather than the manga though, because there's an entire scene in the anime that's not adapted in the manga where Emperor Pilaf, the, the main bad guy in the first arc, he, um, he farts and then he, he, he's upset that one of his disciples or followers noticed that he farts. The other guy didn't say anything. This dog character, he didn't say anything about it. He, no, 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 not at all. But Emperor Pilaf is still pissed that somebody else smelled or heard him fart. And uh, that was just, it was just like two minutes of shit that I didn't care about. Uh-oh. <laughs> Did you hear that? 
Huh? I think you did. No, sire, it wasn't me, I swear! <laughs> the perverted jokes are also like a big part of Dragon Ball, apparently. Uh, since Bulma is the only main girl character for the most part, uh, she is just kind of the subject of perverted jokes from Master Roshi and from uh, the little pig character that I can't remember the name of now. I can't remember his name. It's just childish to me. I, unfortunately, a lot of anime ends up doing this where there's just, there's just too many perverted jokes. I'm like, I get it. I get it. She's a girl. LOL. You've never, you've never seen a girl before. Oh boy, <laughs> she's hot. I really want to make a joke about that. Let's put it in there. Let's put it. There you go. Now, before I do compare the manga to the anime, I did want to talk about the actual story in the first saga. Essentially, the goal throughout this is to find the seven Dragon Balls. Bulma, this human girl, runs into Goku, a monkey boy, and she ends up recruiting him to search for the rest of the Dragon Balls. Each part of the story here introduces new characters like Oolong, that's the pig. He's a shape-shifting pig who is terrorizing a town, but really he's just a coward and a pervert. There's also Yamcha, who's a bandit who ends up joining Goku and Bulma by the end, along with his shape-shifting friend, Puar. And finally, there's Master Roshi, who is the teacher to Goku's deceased grandfather, and who agrees by the end of the arc to train Goku as well. I will admit that each of these characters are kind of interesting in their own way, and I am looking forward to see how they end up playing throughout the entire series. I also really like the road trip vibe that this art gives off. It's a very simple concept, but it becomes entertaining through Toriyama's ability to storytell and slowly incorporate characters and additional concepts without extensive exposition. I think back on the beginning of a lot of popular anime and manga and oftentimes the first chapter is like this exposition dump with too many characters. Dragon Ball does an exceptional job at slowly introducing important concepts without overwhelming the audience. I also like that Goku doesn't have a particular dream or goal. He's still very much a child and seems content to being on an adventure without needing to be Hokage or the Pirate King. I'm sure that this is going to change later on down the road, but that's what makes this beginning so special because we'll be able to uncover those goals alongside Goku. I'm all for having this gigantic dream and goal to go towards. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons I make YouTube videos is because of one of my big goals and dreams in life, but it doesn't mean that I had those dreams my entire life. So seeing Goku as this kid unraveling what makes him tick? What makes him want to be a person, even though he's not really a person? He's, he's kind of a monkey, a half monkey. My, my point is, I, I, I like the way that Dragon Ball starts off with Goku's character. There's very little parts of the saga that I didn't enjoy. Most of it I really enjoyed. The only thing that I can think of that I didn't like was there was this, there was a couple of chapters dedicated to the rabbit mob. That was just kind of, it just felt like it was filler. It didn't really interest me as much. Also, the last few episodes of the anime ended up being padded with extra content, probably because they had to make sure that there was a full 13 episodes for the season rather than, you know, starting the next arc immediately. It was just a little annoying reading the manga and then going to the anime, only for there to be like an entire episode dedicated to some kind of pinball thing that didn't happen in the, in the anime whatsoever. I did like the ending of the saga though, and I'm really looking forward to what's coming next because it could, it could literally be anything. When comparing the manga to the anime, I do prefer the manga. While the anime did have some filler, specifically one of the things I did kind of like was it filled in more of Emperor Pilaf. So he is, like I said earlier, in the villain in the first saga. And it's kind of cool that in the anime, we actually get Emperor Pilaf very early, like in episode one, it kind of like sets that up. It is very cheesy and I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but in the manga, we don't ever see Emperor Pilaf until like the last couple of chapters. So I really didn't know who he was until I got to that part in the manga. Meanwhile, I'm looking up online for the different saga names and the first saga is the Emperor Pilaf saga. I'm like, okay, cool. That's, that's interesting. I don't know who that is. But the anime does a really good job of setting that up. What I don't like so much about the anime has to do with the production quality. The visuals in the anime are close enough to the manga, but not, they're not really that, they're not really that great. It's pretty rough. Let's just, let's just put it that way. It's very rough. And it, it, it comes to the fact that it is a 1980s anime. 
And what was interesting about the animation was the fact that it looked more like a Hanna-Barbera cartoon in the 1960s. There were a lot of different things that, besides the fact of your, like, your typical Japanese anime facial expressions, almost everything else made it seem like a Western cartoon. And I thought that was interesting rather than enjoyable. I, I guess it just goes to show like how far anime has gone since then. But when it comes to the manga, like I really enjoy the artwork that Akira Toriyama has done. His character designs are simple, yet they have an attention to detail, which I really enjoy. And I'm actually super excited to see like more of his art in the future. When it comes to the audio <laughs> in the anime, that was probably my biggest complaint. The voice acting isn't good. The voice acting in Japanese is uh, almost unwatchable. I actually, for the first time ever, turned this from Japanese to English and that was because I figured the English would be better since it was made in 2002 rather than 1980 like the Japanese voice acting is and, and the, the problem that I had with the Japanese voice acting was number one the quality of the mic sounded like complete shit, um which is probably because 1980s and number two there were just like there were some characters voices they were like super high pitched and annoying and I just did not care to listen to that for 200 episodes. <laughs> and so that left me going to the English voice acting and it's serviceable, I guess. It's just, it's just not good. The line delivery is awful. It's just, just not, it's disjointed and it makes it's just annoying. There's also a lot of screaming in this show too. And I know there's going to be a lot of screaming in Dragon Ball Z and that kind of frustrates me, but I, I'm going to have to get over it if I want to watch the show. Other than that, like, I really do like the manga because you don't have to listen to that. And it makes it, it makes it a more enjoyable experience. At the end of the day, the beginning of Dragon Ball surprisingly holds up well. The anime is a little more rough to watch, but the manga is definitely still enjoyable. I'm glad that I'm enjoying it too because I was honestly worried that I wouldn't be able to enjoy this as a guy in his 20s going to something that a lot of people watched when they were a kid. I'm actually excited to keep reading and watching and the next saga is the tournament arc which you kind of see in like a lot of shonen anime after Dragon Ball. So I'm really intrigued to see how Dragon Ball started that trend. Um, I, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be interesting nonetheless. So I'll have another episode later on, probably next month, about that arc and I'm, I'm just gonna try to I'm just gonna kind of truck through and see how far I can get especially with the anime I feel like I'm gonna be able to stick around with the manga for a while I think the anime I might drop at some point but I'm gonna try not to because I really do want to experience as much of this as possible since it is such a big franchise huh? that's all the time we have for today if you liked the video go ahead and hit the like button if for some reason you didn't, you can hit the dislike button. Go ahead and subscribe for more Your Everyday Nerd, and I will see you tomorrow. Goodbye.